and know we will all be understanding. Um, the second piece is to really uh, make every effort to avoid jargon or technical terms um, and uh, to make sure that we are checking in frequently for understanding. Um, when you speak, we're going to ask you to raise your hand first. This is going to help us keep a slow and thoughtful pace. Um, and also, uh, when you're speaking, especially um, if we end up having the translation, it's not just that we'll be taking turns, but that you want to think about having um, one short idea spoken at a time because the person translating has to remember everything that you've said and then translate it. So trying to speak in short bursts would be really helpful. Um, the next one is to, uh, if you tend to be a quieter person, we um, would like to make space for you to share more. And if you're a person who tends to talk a lot, to encourage you to um, do some more listening today so that everyone can participate and uh, to allow for silence when possible um, because sometimes in that silence someone who uh, may, might not share might feel more comfortable jumping in. Um, the next one is to keep things private and don't push for more personal information or details um, or ask someone to prove a need that they've shared. Um, the last one is to really um, make an effort to learn about personal and cultural values. One of the ways that we're going to do that is um, when you first speak, please introduce yourself with your pronouns. Um, we're going to encourage you to stick to talking about your own experiences um, and to remember that ideas about right and wrong are usually um, more cultural values than anything else and they may be different um, between different uh, individuals in the room. So be open to learning by asking lots of questions. Um, so is there anything that anyone uh, would like to add to that or questions or adjustments? And I think that um, in another meeting, Jim had just shared um, that uh, everyone be assured that no matter what is shared or how much it um, is responded to in the meeting, each share is um, being carefully recorded and we're going to hold everyone's input um, as very important. And the other piece of that is just to remember that this is being recorded and will be made public. So if there's something that you don't want to share publicly, you're welcome to reach out to myself or Stephanie um, to share something that you'd like to just have be more anonymous. And we are currently recording and you can find that recording on YouTube. Um, it's if you went to YouTube, you could just look search for ECAC land use task group and it should show up and you may even get the other task group recorded sessions, which you're welcome to listen to and um, hear what they're doing as well. Okay, great. So, Caitlin, did you happen to hear anything back from Rosanna? No. Okay. All right. So we are going to go over the homework responses that many of you all sent in. If you did not get a chance to send in a homework response yet, you're still welcome to do so. Um, you can just feel free to send that to me anytime and all of them will be added together. Um, but some of the highlights uh, for those who did respond, um, just as a reminder, our questions were, where do you get your vegetables? Are you able to grow food where you live? what would make this better or easier and how does local produce come into your life or not um, there was a resounding uh, support for the mobile market which we're gonna get to hear about more today a lot of people are getting their um, produce and specifically their local fruits and vegetables from the mobile market um, Many of the um, people who responded do not have the ability to grow food where they live. And um, there was uh, consistent uh, feedback that that would be really helpful to have access to um, a place to grow food, um, whether that be at your home or a community garden. 
Um, and uh, many people mentioned that they also um, go to Stop and Shop and that there's, they did not find a lot of local produce options at Stop and Shop. Um, and then uh, some people did respond that they uh, are homeowners and that they are able to um, grow their own produce and um, uh, that a few of the people who have the option don't actually use it right now, but they felt like if they had a community garden, they might be more interested in growing in that setting. So those were the responses that I had heard back. Um, is there anybody who uh, didn't get your responses in or want to sh add to that uh, presentation? So I didn't get my responses in <laughs> because what I've been remiss in doing for a really long time is sending out the um, report from our Amherst Food Justice planning process. Um, and um, a lot of the questions uh, that you asked are answered in there. And I would say, you know, with that group, <laughs> which I did ask those questions of um, repeatedly, it was kind of like a resounding no, we don't have the space to grow our own food. And yes, it would be helpful to have the space to grow our own food. Um, but yeah, I do uh, it's still on my to do list to send that report. It's like ready to go. I just need to um, send it out to all the key stakeholders. So uh, I, I'll have a lot more info for you coming up. Awesome. Thanks, uh, Caitlin. Romy, did um, you want to share those thoughts with the group or no pressure if not, but. No, sure. I actually just emailed you, but all of my responses are pretty much exactly the same. Um, I would love to get more local uh, fruits and vegetables, but they are sold not in the normal like chore stores. Um, so it is more of a headache, more of a hassle. And I would love to grow my own but I also am a renter and that's not a possibility for me. Um, and I was thinking not only would a community garden be great, but I think that those plots should be made available free of the, of the charge that is, that is offered at local community gardens to renters to, you know, entice them to be used. Um, they should be subsidized. Um, and I, you know, it's also, it's, it's sort of a guilt thing, I think, for a lot of us when we can't buy our local fruits and vegetables, you know, in a good way, in a bad way, but those, that's, those are my responses. Marita, thanks, Romy. Um, I think one of the things that I also noticed after I, turned in my um, responses, is that some people were mentioning that they would want to have more education about how to grow a garden. And there's some people who they do have the space, they just don't really know how to do it. So doing some type of like community education for those people would be very helpful for them. And you could be the one to do that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I love that. Uh, um, so I neglected to introduce myself. Uh, I'm Jim Newman. Uh, I prefer he, him, his pronouns. Uh, and um, so first, thanks everybody to come. This is great. Awesome to move into this next step in our meeting process. Um, we have, uh, so uh, I think what we'll do here is, um, Caitlin, I think what I'll do is I'll just talk briefly about the principles uh, that we generated last time and then hand it to you if you're up for it 
or we can figure out what we want to do about talking about the mobile market. Um, uh, does that seem okay? Hmm? Hmm? Yeah, good. Uh, sounds great. Um, so uh, in our conversation last time, we had generated some principles for to sort of guide us uh, to how we want to work to go after the things we're trying to trying to do. Uh, today, we're probably going to talk more about what things we actually want to do. Uh, but we last time we used the time to really develop some strong ideas about how we do things. And so there we listed four principles in the notes that we pulled together that really rose to the top. Uh, the first of those principles was to um, to foster stronger connections to nature for all residents and visitors through our local lands, especially for youth of color. Uh, and to some extent, this is, you know, Marita is just now again to understand how to garden and to have that connection. Uh, um, the second is to prioritize equitable and convenient access to green and open spaces where people already live, work, and play. Uh, in other words, to work to dismantle the barriers to access uh, uh, for the use, for access and use of natural lands. Um, this was, there was quite a lot of discussion about this in the last meeting, which was really fantastic. And that was a very strong principle that came forward. The third is to use incentives to strategically encourage the things we want and to discourage the things we don't want. I love this. It's so clean and obvious. Uh, and that's part of what we're trying to figure out today is what do we want? What do we not want? Um, and the fourth is to encourage responsible stewardship of our natural areas and systems, especially our farms, rivers, and wetlands, which carry a uh, sort of enhanced importance uh, in many ways to our natural systems. Um, so before we get into the uh, discussion of sort of the, we're going to frame this discussion today as, uh, as starting with a couple of what we're calling big moves, big moves. Uh, the um, things that we think are really important, have, make a big statement, or will have a big effect. Uh, and we'll start with a couple so that we can kind of work through what effects do we think they have. But before we get to that, um, I am going to hand this to Caitlin a little bit to talk about the mobile market. Um, you can tell me we can wait and do this in a little bit if Johanny and uh, Rosanna show up, but I'm nervous that uh, they may have gotten waylaid doing something. Yeah. Um... I'm, I'm thinking a little bit because we did have a, like a plan about how we were going to talk about it. Um, well, we can just wait if you want. Yeah, maybe if we could, if there's sort of another place that might fit into the agenda, um, and we could just wait and see a little bit. That would be great. Yeah, totally, totally works. Yeah, okay. uh, I don't, we, you know, we don't have, <laughs> we have agendas to help us. Right, right. Because <laughs> it's, it's they're not helping us. Hey, why are we, uh, <laughs> Um, that sounds great. Uh, so um, maybe what we'll do is move to frame the uh, the big moves um, uh, that we uh, uh, that we started to develop out of this conversation last time. And so the idea of big moves is. Um, that there are going to be a couple of things that have to do with land use and natural systems uh, that are important, big, play a big role. They may encompass a number of different actions, but we can think of them as a one big thing. 
uh, the, the first of those uh, big moves was uh, sort of the responsible renewable energy siting. And so there was a discussion about, you know, forests and the importance of forests and not cutting down trees to put solar panels up and where might we site and what, where, how do we meet our principles in doing this and yet increase the amount of solar energy to drive down uh, our, uh, the carbon uh, emissions from our energy use. And then maybe there's some other characteristics like creating uh, places, places where we can think about uh, sort of community-based solar. The second uh, is the incre to increase the use of town open space and green space for recreation. That a big item that came forward was that uh, the sort of understanding, the knowledge, the um, process of using town open space was not as widespread as we had thought, and that there were a lot of barriers to that. And so how do we increase those barriers, which has a lot of uh, great secondary characteristics or important characteristics of A, making people healthier, making them feel better, but also um, increasing connection to the natural world, which makes them, helps to make the natural systems more important and gain more importance within our uh, decision-making process. So I know that Steve, has something to say about the siting, the renewable energy uh, um, uh, items. So Steve, would you like to uh, jump into this right now? Yes, um, thank you. I'm Steve Roof, he, him pronouns. Um, as I mentioned last time, I'm a professor at Hampshire College of Earth and Environmental Science. And I've lived in Amherst, oh, uh, couple of decades, I think. Uh, so I, what I, we've talked a lot about the values of open space. Um, the ECAC has also made a, a commitment and the town has uh, agreed to the commitment. The town council passed the commitment and I'm bring up my notes here. We are intending to reduce townwide greenhouse gas emissions 25% by 2025. That's four or five years from now. 50% by 2030, so within 10 years, and 100% no later than 2050. Those are big goals. Uh, we don't know exactly how we're going to get there, but they're big goals. So I propose, as a big idea, it's a controversial idea, I suspect, that we build enough solar-powered fields, PV arrays, inside Amherst boundaries to generate 100% of the town's Townwide electricity use. We generate electricity for everybody in town, university, town, residents, so on. Um, are we willing to do that? If I did some calculations this afternoon, I'm pretty sure these are about right. To do that, we would need to use about 500 acres of land. Uh, that's based on sort of typical PV production per acre. 500 acres is about three quarters of a mile. Um, Hampshire College property is about 800 acres, so it would be you know, two thirds of the area of Hampshire College, which is a pretty big patch, patch of land. If we look at it in terms of the percent of conservation land in Amherst, it would be 10 to 11% of preserved conservation land. That's open space plus protected forests, like on the flank of, flanks of the Holyoke Range. So would we be willing as a community to commit to developing that much land in order to generate all of our own electricity locally in town? So great, great question. Does anybody have questions about uh, sort of what Steve is talking about or thinking about? Bernard? Not so much a question, an initial response is, yes, of course, uh, we should do that. But I, the way I get there is to think about what would the alternative be and all the negative impacts that implies. I'm already doing that on my farm because that's what I have control of. It makes sense financially, et cetera. Um, so often, uh, as a general rule, thinking about many proposals as 
well, what are the other conceivable alternatives? You know, it doesn't make sense not to deal with climate change. The conceivable alternatives are so bad. So instead of it in a bubble, let's compare it to something. And I end up with several steps down the line. Yes, of course we should do that. <laughs> Thanks for that. Uh, appreciate it. Uh, Romy or Marita, do you have any uh, questions or thoughts that this uh, uh, sort of leads you to? Um, not questions, but I thought about this actually for a while. Um, I don't understand why we, I mean, legally, town bylaw wise, I understand why it is harder to do multiple use of certain land systems. Um, but I think it might be beneficial to consider um, using, you know, the already developed roads uh, and create solar panel coverage over roads. Um, it would reduce need for slow snow plows, reduce potholes and road maintenance, um, reduce heating in places that have multiple roads or are parking lot areas, um, and would create a sort of kind of tourist attraction, you know, the, the solar tunnel streets. <laughs> I love it. That's awesome. Uh, Marita, any uh, questions or thoughts? I know. Yeah. <laughs> um, no, I think that um, I agree with um, Bernard. I mean, with all the ideas, I agree with Bernard also, like seeing if there is another alternative way to before we go that route. And I think it's, that's an interesting thought for the road coverage too. I never thought about that as well. Cool. Um, so uh, I, there's, there's an interesting thing that Steve has sort of set up here, which is the, uh, the um, we're talking about sort of what are some of the big ideas around how we use land? Remember, this is the land use uh, and natural systems uh, group. And so how do we use land? And, um, and clearly thinking about you know, solar production as one thing in one place, it's like a big thing the size of Hampshire College, uh, um, is, uh, uh, it is probably not, you know, sort of the right thought. I think Romy's thought of like, okay, well, let's put it along, you know, sort of along streets and sort of around, it probably makes more sense as to how would it actually happen. But there are there other ways that it might, uh, that we might be able to think about this in terms of uh, what, uh, what we can do, say, through zoning incentives, or maybe, and when I say zoning incentives, what I mean is uh, that in places, if things are being changed uh, and land is being used differently, say there's a forest that's about to be turned into uh, some housing, or there's a you know, a formerly, uh, a formal mall that's about to be turned into something else. Uh, that that action, there's zoning uh, that starts to govern those things. And so maybe there's a question uh, that we can answer related to our principles around say, uh, how do we strategically encourage the things we want and discourage the things we don't want? Are there ways to do that? Or maybe how do we encourage responsible stewardship of our natural areas uh, and systems? Uh, and what does responsible mean in terms, of, uh, in terms of those natural systems and those natural areas? Uh, is it, you know, is it, uh, and I'll offer some suggestions, but they're really only suggestions you know, is responsible uh, making sure things are undisturbed or is responsible making sure that uh, open areas are, uh, are incur use is encouraged in open areas? What, what does responsibility really mean for us in this group relative to the sort of land that might be used uh, in a large scale solar deployment, as it were, putting solar in a lot of places in town? 
So I have one thought about that. So for me, I just think there is a really important trade off like, um, you know, I hate seeing solar arrays on large tracts of arable land. Um, so to me, responsible um, land stewardship and solar means putting solar in places um, where other uses aren't as possible for the land. So for example, brown fields or over parking lots or things like that. Um, so, uh, so something there about uh, responsibility being, being about uh, preserving some lands that have higher and better uses in a sense for the community uh, and re and double using or triple using lands that are already disturbed. Uh, Gazikaya? Yeah, so I was just going to ask like what are the what are the downsides to um and it sounds like Caitlin was I was wondered Caitlin if you could expand on what you mean by you hate to see them on something kind of land. I didn't catch the word you said. And then um also I'm wondering do we know of specific ways in which like low income and community of color um spaces are like negatively impacted by putting solar arrays or if that's you know what what questions should we be asking when we hear the idea of putting all these solar panels in Caitlin you want to uh yeah sorry um so respond to that first part of that yeah so what I said Gazi Kaya was um I I hate to see solar arrays on arable land. So as in land that could be used for agriculture. I mean, I guess I would also say like land um, that could be used for outdoor recreation. Um, and I think Jim put it really well when he said, you know, if there is a higher and better use for the land, um, it feels like sort of stealing it away from that higher and better use to put a large solar array on it. Yeah, Marita. Yeah, I guess um, in response to what Gazit said, um, also for like, I feel like in lower income areas, there's a lot, what I was thinking of was like places for children to play, like in areas where there's like she was saying about recreational areas, because I feel like that could be an issue for children in lower income areas, like not having space to explore it and play. So I think that's a great, yeah, go ahead, Romy. Thanks, Marita. Sorry, no, please respond to what Marita just said. Nope, go ahead, you're, you're on. Um, I was just going to say that, um, I mean, it sounds like the, the kind of debate here is happening around, you know, the, this zoning question of what is and isn't allowable because, you know, the solar panels fields have been found to actually increase biodiversity in an area uh, because they protect, uh, create shaded, shaded spaces, cooler spaces, and spaces for animals to rest. So in a way, you know, those areas, if they are allowed to be multiple use, can provide multiple uses, you know. Um, <laughs> so that, that's just a thought I had. I, I also agree that there are places that you know, they make more sense, like Caitlin was saying, that, that where they can be more obviously sort of effective, but the idea that they ruin a, a nature scape is not scientifically, you know, I think aesthetically, yes, but scientifically is not 100% accurate. That's great. I'd be interested in Bernard's uh, perspective on this because you, clearly you've done some of this work yourself on your farm. I'm going to put you on the spot. Sorry, unmute. Um, um, <laughs> yeah, well, I, I put it on top of existing roofs, which you know nobody nobody would argue is right. is, is a terrible idea. Um, I will bring up that UMass has been doing experiments with uh, disperse arrays. The idea being you don't have total coverage of the land, you have them up on 
um, stilts, and uh, you can still grow things underneath. Now, the, the results from a farmer's point of view are mixed. Um, it's not as high production, uh, but it does get at the idea of mixed use. In general, this kind of technology, I think it's best used or, or distributed and independent. So above roads and on every roof, it probably makes more sense than literally covering the Hampshire campus. Um, but again, yeah, I don't know, the devil's in, in, in the details. Um, but I think the goal is laudable and better than alternatives that we might end up with. So I'm already like, well, let's figure out how to get it done appropriately. I, I'm past arguing about whether we should <laughs> get it done. Whether we should do uh, it, yeah. <laughs> but on, on the farm, it's it's up. In, you, you did mention, and I'll just jump in with, with zoning kinds of things. Um, for better or worse, we're in a capitalistic, whatever, putting dollar values gets things done. Um, so for a developer that wants to put in a new building, it's very cheap and inexpensive for us to say, uh, if you do it net carbon neutral or zero or net producer, we'll you know, let you go a story higher, we'll advance your uh, uh, permitting a year instead of waiting to go all through. Those are things that cost the town nothing, but are huge incentives. Uh, I haven't gotten to specific ideas of how does that apply to larger land uses, but in general, tying money to it, and I'll jump in with, maybe we'll get to this, but a price on carbon hmm. uh, is essential, whether we impose it or somebody else. So we will tax, penalize those producing more than X, and we should be paying those that are saving or farmers land use, specifically sequestering uh, measurable amounts would really change the dynamic very effectively using our existing financial system. I'll be quiet and listen. Uh, well, that was great. Thank you for, uh, um, I, th again, um, you know, I, I know that you have some experience both as a farmer and as a, huh, very nice team, uh, and, uh, um, and, you know, doing some solar uh, development and, you know, trying to trying to figure out how these things work together in different ways, uh, um, and the, you know, th those are in many ways the details that you know are what we're talking about. It's like, how does it work? Uh, I think the question of how, what effects, uh, solar development might have in uh rental communities or lower income communities um what do we want to be take care of what do we want to steward versus what do we uh what can we potentially get uh what are the benefits that are potentially available to lower income uh or rental uh uh, uh renters within uh a setting like that now that this is a topic that comes up in the renewables group uh, talking about community solar, but um, uh, but I think we need to think about it in terms of how how places are used and what we encourage to happen in places, and uh, uh, you know this is um, anyway. It, I think that that's the sort of the question that we're after is like how do how do we best make these encouragements. Uh, yeah, go ahead. I had one more thing just because I've done it at my farm is solar hot water. Mm. So often we talk about solar as PV. Um, we can reduce the amount of electricity needed if we heat water directly. It's much cheaper, uh, but it has to be essentially on the buildings it's being used. It's currently nicely incentivized. So maybe just telling everybody that in my case, it's a year payback, it, it, particularly good. Um, but even several years, it, I think it takes six or eight times the area of PV that you would need for solar thermal to heat the same amount of water, and it's much cheaper. So thing, this, is, this is one big thing, if it's done a lot, that could reduce the total amount of electricity that's needed, and therefore the acreage of PV that would be needed. Uh, I think it 
it's worth going back to simpler 1970s tech uh, to get the right job done for, let's say, heating water. Thanks. Great. Yeah, Kazika. I apologize. I just stepped away for a moment to call Rosanna and Johanny, and they're they're on their way. Um, Great. So I'm glad we waited. Perfect. Good. And um, I I missed a few minutes there, so I apologize if I'm repeating something. But I was curious. Um, someone mentioned putting them on roofs. Do we have enough roofs uh, to get that square mileage? If we could convince all the landlords and so forth. That, that's a really good question, and I have not tried to calculate how much roof area is in within the town of Amherst that might be suitable. Um, I did have my students do this for activity at Hampshire College, and we quickly discovered that not a lot of roofs of the buildings at Hampshire College were suitable. They didn't face the right direction, they were broken up, or on some of the bigger buildings, the flat roofs, there's already a bunch of stuff up there. The heating and um, cooling equipment is mounted on the roofs. So we were surprised that um, there wasn't that much roof. Now, if we had really big malls like Hadley, that would be a really good location. Um, but that, I think you're, the, a good point is that in terms of encouraging and incentivizing, incentivize those roofs. Barns can be good roofs. Um, other warehouses could be good roof. So that I would definitely go, go with that first before covering more land, um, but be prepared that it's only gonna get us part way there. Stephanie. So one of the challenges that we had- Oop, you're, You need to turn up, sorry. Sorry, sorry, sorry about that. Um, one yep. of the challenges we've had with the, um, with the town's rooftops uh, is the age of the building and that roof, roofs are of an age where they maybe need to be replaced before you can install solar, um, which is an additional expense, um, which isn't to say maybe that's something that can be incentivized is, you know, providing funding for people to um, restore their roofs or to update their roofs. Um, there's that piece. And then the other piece I wanted to say is I really think there's a, a real opportunity for parking lots in town. We have a lot of parking areas. Sorry, can you hear me? All of a sudden, I. Okay. Yeah, yeah, no, you're um, good. So, um, I would say there's a lot of parking areas in town that really could be utilized for solar. Um, I know that it's a little bit more expensive, but again, it just seems like that's an opportunity. I'm, I'm not in favor, uh, as Caitlin said. I'm personally not in favor of using agricultural lands for, for solar. Stephanie, do you know if the proposal by the, the Sunrise Movement has made any progress that they proposed at least a study to put parking lot PV on some of the school grounds, if I remember correctly? Is that? That's going through a process. Um, I think that there may have been, um, there may have been uh, a meeting of the Finance Committee, I think, this week. And I believe they were looking at that proposal, um, uh, but I'm not sure how far it's gotten through the gauntlet yet. So I, unfortunately, I don't have an update. So perhaps there's a, a whole uh, sort of um, action here, which is, uh, and I'm trying to think, I know another community that's done this really specifically. I know that, Cambridge has done some, hey, fantastic. Uh, uh, and um, to do, Johanny, lovely to see you. Um, so maybe we pause uh, for one moment and let uh, Rosanna come in so that she can hear what to translate. It, or if, there we go. Thanks, Jim. Hola, Johanny. Hola, Rosanna. Y Rosanna, dinos cuando tú tienes toda la... Ok. ¿Están en te por teléfono? ¿Está bien? 
Ustedes están en mudo, los dos. Ok, ahora sí. Ahora Gracias. sí. Ok. Y, y estamos... que en mudo también. Hi, hi to all. Um, sorry, I, I have a, <laughs> oh, another, another schedule in my mind at 6.30. <laughs> sorry for that. Están aquí ahora. Esa es la cosa más importante. Y bienvenidos. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. So, uh, Jim, maybe if you want to give a little uh, brief, uh, catch them up to what we're talking about, and then... We can go from there. Great. So I'm going to catch up Rosanna and uh, Johanny to our conversation right now, which is about uh, solar, putting solar panels in different places around town. Okay, you can go ahead, Jim. Just sort of built a uh, kind of a, a vision, an idea of how we decide where is the best place to put solar panels and where we need to not put solar panels to protect the land for what it is or what is happening there. So use it. So um, the, I would ask one question of Johanny and uh, Rosanna uh, about that, which is the places that you know or are live in or near that are open spaces and might you might be able to put solar panels there. Where would be good? Where would be bad? Yeah, Johanny said didn't, she didn't know uh, where, uh, about uh, big spaces. And for me, um, I think it's the, 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 the best place. Uh, well, is there are farmers next to the East Hadley Road, I think is, I saw some, some uh, pan solar panels uh, in that place. Uh, yeah, I, I didn't. I didn't saw other other places. Um, okay, yo.
Yeah, she remembered now uh, after I I saw those uh, panels. Yeah, she she remembered too about that and and other areas, big areas where big spaces. I think is the the project that you have in mind. Yes, in the the golf area <laughs> could be. Yeah, Johannes, Johannes said that um, if she's thinking in the in the golf area also, but she is worried that if they if if people put the um, the solar panels, uh, the community the community will not have enough space for creation areas. <laughs> so she's thinking on that. <laughs> Marita? Um, I just have a question. Does anyone know what's happening with that golf course that I heard is closing in South Amherst? Just, I figured that'd be like a great space. <laughs> Let those guys catch up. Stephanie? So, uh, yeah, Stephanie, you want to answer that? Or sure. There you are. Um, so um, there's a separate company that's proposing the solar development, um, but that's only for a portion of the golf course. So there'll be more opportunity to do other things. And right now there's no real um, solid plan yet. But I know some of the things that were talked about were community gardens, because we thought that would be something that would really be great and close by to the housing complexes. All set. Great. Um, so this that's the perfect uh, segue uh, to, uh, I had to for us to take a little uh, break and uh, have a conversation about the mobile market. Uh, Ashwin, did you want to tee that up? No. Sorry, wrong thing. Uh, Jim, uh, can I jump in one second? Yeah, please. I'm sorry. I just wanted to, um, Dave Zomek apologizes that he can't make the meeting because, as I said, he was uh, helping out with the elections and there's a lot happening regarding that this week. So he was unable to join us this evening, but he did want you all to know that he's sorry he couldn't make it. Great. Thank you. Uh, okay. So, Caitlin, Johanny, Rosanna, we're going to turn over the meeting to you to tell us some stories about the mobile market. Sure. Y Johanny, queremos escuchar su voz. Si está hablando en español, no importa. Queremos escuchar su voz. Sí, por favor. Okay. 
Rosanna. Um, so what Rosanna and uh, Johanny and I talked about a little bit over email was I thought I would give some context for sort of how this conversation got started. Um, and then Rosanna would um, fill in a little bit about her connections and, and the role that she played in it. Um, and then Johanny can update us on what's going on with the mobile market now because she's definitely the closest to it. And okay. actually, I'm realizing I said that the wrong way around. We talked about you going first, Rosanna. Yes, I <laughs> am going first. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I, um, for quite some time, I could observe that the Latino community was an invisible population in the town. Um, this population is characterized uh, by being a working population with many hours of work uh, during the day, with many family responsibilities, and with many needs to solve, um, especially about food, transportation, language, uh, health, etc. Um, at the same time, uh, the population preferred to remain also silent, anonymous. Um, and this started when, um, with Amherst Family Outreach, we began to make community lunches. After coordination, or we decided to be partners uh, uh, because I, I, I was interesting uh, for people to be there, uh, Latino people to be there and to share uh, um, with uh, other, other people. And uh, because I, I, I was already working with community for years, uh, I would, would accompany Latino families uh, to these lunches so they can meet all the members of the community. And, and here, uh, where we organize meetings to dialogue and also to make presentations on topics of interest or um, for us it it is always a priority to maintain the confidentiality of people because they also ask ask for for it uh, so um and that 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 was uh yeah that was of one of the reasons that the people are trying to be sometimes invisible <laughs> yes um uh, but um well, then with Francine, we, uh, we took over from her college and that was when we started having the community lunch together. When I started my work with Healthy Hampshire, this was a great opportunity to, to speak about all the needs all, uh, of the community and um, the, the risk of food insecurity that that many go through and and the great need to empower um, the community so that it can find its own voice that was uh, uh, that we wanted and and talk about what IELTS then for example propose solutions and demand actions to if after they are empowered. It is truly satisfying to walk alongside the community and witness its, its empowerment. Um, in this case, Healthy Hampshire is giving all its experience and resources so that this path continues to be built. That's, that's it. <laughs> so Kaylin has a lot of things to, to say also, and, and Johanny too. <laughs> Did you want to translate what you, or summarize in translation what you just said for you, honey? Yes.
Okay, great. So um, for Healthy Hampshire's part, we had just finished doing this big um, food access uh, planning process, looking at um, the entire county, and we collected a lot of data during that process. And um, the data definitely showed us that there were some significant challenges in Amherst, um, both related to healthy food not being available and accessible in the town of Amherst, but also relating to people not being able to get to it. So transportation came up as a big challenge as well. Um, but not due, you know, to anyone's particular fault. We, we tried to get um, folks from Amherst involved in the planning process and it didn't pan out. We didn't have any voices of Amherst residents involved in that initial food access planning process. And so basically we knew we had this data telling us there were challenges and we wanted to talk to people on the ground about that data and find out a little bit more about those challenges and how to address them. So I think someone at CES where Rosanna and I work said, you know, Rosanna Salazar, she works so much with the um, Amherst community. You should really talk to her about how to get more Amherst residents involved in this conversation. So that's how Rosanna and I found this really awesome opportunity for collaboration um, in terms of being able to use the community lunch um, as a space to talk about issues related to food insecurity. Um, and so from there, we, we got a bunch of information, but we um, wanted to bring more of like the stakeholders um, and um, people who sort of pull the bigger levers around food systems into the conversation as well. So we did this Amherst food justice planning process where we, um, in addition to the folks we were speaking to at the community lunch, we also brought in professionals like Stephanie and others to participate in the conversation. Um, and so we, of course, confirmed, you know, that a, a lot of what we were seeing was true um, about, you know, folks having trouble um, with accessing healthy food, um, there being transportation gaps. Um, and we also learned about a lot of sort of intersecting factors, um, such as structural racism and um, um, like 
fear and these other sort of, um, you know, economic instability and um, lack of access to jobs and things like that, that were really confounding, um, I mean, not confounding, compounding the um, challenges around um, healthy food access. So the group came up with mobile farmers markets as one of the solutions or supported mobile farmers markets as one of the solutions they'd like to see um, to address these challenges. And um, Healthy Hampshire had the experience of helping to launch mobile farmers markets in other communities. Um, and so we were able to essentially get funding and start the conversation um, to make a mobile farmers market happen in Amherst. So um, we continued to engage a lot of the folks we'd been talking to. We brought in some new partners to plan specifically for the mobile market. And one of the things, one of the goals that we heard loud and clear um, was that people wanted the mobile market to be an employment opportunity um, for folks in their communities. So we had the money and we had a lot of good input from people about what they wanted to see in the mobile market. And we used that to develop a request for proposals to find um, someone to operate the Amherst mobile market. So uh, we had three applicants um, to the request for proposals and the applicant that the group loved <laughs> by far was um, Ryan Carb from Many Hands Farm Poor, um, who was really on board with the idea of um, using the mobile market not only as an employment opportunity for um, the residents who have been involved in our conversations, but also as a means to really um, shift some of the power that we were holding down and out to the community.
And so Johanny got hired on as a mobile market manager, which is why she's the person in this room who knows the most about the, how the mobile market's going now. So I will turn it over to her. Bueno, como, como dice que está continuando con Kelly Rosana, eh, ese proyecto de desenlace de Kelly Rosana ha rendido muchos frutos, que es el carro móvil. Entonces, es un gran proyecto grande porque la, la comunidad está muy agradecida. Nosotros estamos muy agradecidos como comunidad también en colaborar y también por la oferta de trabajo, que, que podemos tener trabajo en la misma comunidad, trabajando con la comunidad y al mismo tiempo también teniendo un empleo. Entonces, eh, eh, es, es un proyecto excelente porque la persona no tenía acceso a alimentos frescos, a, a vegetales saludables y lo, lo mejor es que están cerca de su comunidad, donde las personas pueden ir, a, a, eh, por ejemplo, pueden ir caminando, eh, las personas que están en otro complejo, la persona, aquí por ejemplo en Jardín son cinco complejos, los cinco complejos vienen el mismo, al mismo lugar a comprar, estamos ubicados en, en dos complejos más también, en Olimpia Drive y en Barena. Y, y en Fort River, entonces todas las personas están muy agradecidas, la comunidad esa, eh, me ha expresado a nosotros los, los gerentes de que es algo que ellos no habían visto, o sea, es, es algo nuevo y un proyecto excelente que ellos quieren que siga y que el otro año sea todavía mejor, o sea, que sigamos teniendo los mismos vegetales, que la comunidad y el pueblo siga colaborando para que ese proyecto siga creciendo y te, aparte del, del mercado móvil tengamos más actividades para, para la comunidad y eso es un proyecto, ha sido excelente o sea, yo, yo puedo decir que ha sido excelente. Ok, gracias, Johanny. Uh, well, um, para Johanny esta, esta ha sido una gran oportunidad y... Um, eh, Todavía está hablando en español. Oh, <laughs> okay, <laughs> sí, sí, sí. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, for Johanny, this this was a great opportunity. Um, eh, 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 she she feels that eh, uh, Kaylin and Rosanna are doing a great job. Uh, they the people are very grateful uh, for this opportunity to have this opportunity. And, and for this, um, this, this is a, an excellent project. Uh, they, they didn't have, the, the communities or the people, they didn't have the, the fresh products uh, around them. So um, that the, many times the people has to, to, to walk to have these, uh, these, these products um, available. Um, and, uh, now they have um, uh, four places in the community uh, in the, with the mobile market, and uh, and this this is for her. This is amazing. This uh, the people are very enthusiastic that we could have these mobile markets the next year and 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 the other years too. <laughs> but uh, so. Uh, she's very grateful for this opportunity because they have also uh, jobs uh, here. Okay, thanks. Yeah, that's, that's it, unless there's anything else you want us to hit upon. <laughs> Just that, Caitlin, would you please take over all of Amherst and just help us coordinate it to have these projects in every way? <laughs> it's not all sunshine and rainbows. Sometimes it's, you know, it's great. Sometimes it's really challenging, but um, I think it's, you know, on the whole, it's been a really, really awesome project to be involved in. Does anybody have questions or thoughts? One sec, Rosana's translating.
Um, I did actually, I'll just jump in really quick because I'm reminded that Stephanie asked me today for some um, data on the mobile market, which meant um, I, I kind of pulled it quickly, um, but I'll give some sort of like quick stats. So um, 172 people have signed up for farm shares. Um, and this is as of week seven. Um, and as of that week, a total of about 3,700 additional produce items have been sold through a la carte sales in addition to what was given out in the farm, um, in the farm shares. Um, and I will also say um, we did some qualitative surveys and the um, demographics of the mobile market um, skew heavily toward communities of color and um, toward lower and moderate income communities than that population of Amherst overall. I think we now have a bunch of people raising their hands. So I'm not sure, Marita, had you raised your hand? And then Stephanie, it looks like Ashwin and Bernard. So I'm not sure what order we want to go in, but. I think Bernard was in early. Um, I, I thought I, this might be an appropriate time to add a brief uh, perspective from the production side of the mobile market. Uh, the successful RSP went to Many Hands Farm Corps. That's the CSA on my farm. Uh, from a land use perspective, we could easily double, quadruple, even next year production. Probably do that a few years. Um, it would take labor and community connections, which are being done. You've just heard about some of those. We would love to see those. Um, be iterated and expanded. But all of this is based on grant funding through Hampshire, Healthy Hampshire, which is terrific, but it's fragile. If that goes away, these connections go away. So it also suggests a solution of finding sustainable funding sources to bridge this, uh, the community needs and the, the production land use needs. I'm so sorry. I have to uh, go and do dinner with kiddo. I'm so sorry to hop out late, everyone. Thank you. Thanks, Bernard. That was great. Stephanie? I have to make sure this is um, uh, OK and that it'll be funded. But through Caitlin, I just wanted to double check. But it sounds like Ryan has requested extending the season into October. And the town manager has given his approval. So it sounds like that will be extended. And also Ryan was already wanting to know about next year. And I think the town manager is very supportive and thinks this is important and basically just asked him what days of the week he'd be wanting to do it next year. So 
it's really looking good for next year also. That that's definitely a good opportunity um, for a shout out to the landholders who are making this um, mobile market possible, which include the town of Amherst, um, Amherst Regional Public Schools, and um, the Wayfinders um, Community Community. I think they're a community development corporation, um, affordable housing developer. Ashwin, you uh, you want to jump in? Yeah, I just had a question. Um, where can we find more information about the mobile market? Um, and especially, where do we go to share information? ¿Dónde se puede encontrar información sobre el mercado móvil? Y si es que hay una página web que podemos compartir. So the best place is definitely Facebook. The Amherst Mobile Market has its own Facebook page. Um, there is a page on the Many Hands Farm Corps website, but the that the, the Many Hands web platform is a little more limited than what we're able to do with Facebook. So Facebook's the best way to go. I just wanted to give Marita a chance um, to jump in. It sounds like you're having some phone difficulties. So if there's anything you want to add before that goes away. Yeah, no, saying, my phone isn't charging that well, so I might cut out, but I'm not trying to leave abruptly. <laughs> um, but no, I noticed that because I live in South Amherst, I noticed that a lot of the community members that I talk to, they're very excited about the mobile food bank and it's been like a great I think it's been a very great addition to the community and like getting people even out to talk to each other yeah. and like meet even meet new people and like talk about different things that are going on in the community as well so i think it's great that they're extending it and they're going to have it next year as well I really agree that the secondary like social and community aspect of it has probably meant the most to me. Like uh, I see so many of my neighbors walking out and we can say hi and we can have a nice moment together and then, you know, talk about what we've picked up or what we're enjoying. And it's just really felt like a nice community um, way to be together. I actually had another question. Um, one of my neighbors asked, can anyone go or is it specifically for like lower income or is it for everybody in Amherst? 
Anybody can shop there. And it, Kaylee, please, can you repeat? Oh, uh, yeah, anyone can shop at the mobile market. And, and uh, the staff speak English, Spanish, and Korean, so. <laughs> Se habla español. <laughs> Are we ready to go? Sorry, I'm okay. Um, so again, this brings up the question of how we use land and what gets done in different in land in different settings. Uh, the question about the golf course came up, uh, and uh, there are some uh, questions about food production there, some questions about solar production, uh, and there might be some other things uh, that, that could potentially happen in that area that is in pretty close to some important places. Uh, Ashwin, did you, uh, this I believe was the topic that you were interested in talking about. <laughs> I got it wrong earlier. Yeah, so um, what I was uh, going to do is speak a little bit more about, uh, or speak briefly about the other kind of big move that we were contemplating. Um, oh, sorry, Rosanna, are you translating still? Uh, as, as we, can, you can translate yourself. Okay, yeah, yeah, fine. Part, okay, <laughs> great. Great, so I saw that you were talking, so I wasn't sure. Okay, um, so Steve uh, presented earlier um, one kind of big move that's likely to make it into the plan, uh, which is to move towards having enough solar electricity production uh, to generate all of our electricity in Amherst. And we had a nice discussion about where that might be cited. Uh, the other kind of big move that came out of some of our previous discussions uh, with some of you all was uh, how to make sure that we have more and more accessible green space and open space for recreation. And so what I want to do right now is open up a conversation about how we can get more green space, more open space, where we can have those things, uh, and how to deal with some of the barriers that people face to accessing those spaces. Um, some, of, some of those barriers are uh, to do with transportation, being able to move around easily. Some have to do with information, knowing where to go. Uh, others have to do with resources, um, having access to uh, time, money, et cetera. And then there's other issues around feeling welcome, which of course are racialized in our society and indeed in our community. Uh, so I would love to hear, and we would all love to hear, um, any ideas that people have about how to think about this. And a big piece of it for me too, uh, is as the Energy and Climate Action Committee, we're interested in thinking about how to connect people with environmental issues, how to connect people with our goal of uh, making a difference on climate change. But I think it's really important also to have people connected to land um, and have people with give people many opportunities to connect 
uh, to green and open spaces. Um, because that's how you get people involved in the process and how we can all feel like this space is ours together and that stewarding it well is something that we can do as a community. Um, okay, entonces en español. Mientras anteriormente Steve uh, presentó el primer pues, movimiento grande, el big move que estamos contemplando, uh, yo no tengo nada tan concreto como él, pero la otra cosa, aparte, aparte de lo que uh, presentó él sobre la energía solar y cómo podemos uh, avanzar hacia un sistema en que tenemos 100% de, nuestro, de nuestra este, uh, generación eléctrica uh, hecho de una manera local, um, la otra cosa, el otro tema que salió de nuestras discusiones anteriores fue el tema de tener más uh, espacio abierto, espacios verdes y más espacios verdes accesibles a todos los miembros de la comunidad. Entonces queremos invitar una discusión, una conversación abierta sobre este tema. Y anteriormente identificamos varias barreras uh, en cuanto al acceso, barreras uh, Diferentes. Y algunos tienen que ver con la transportación, um, la man las maneras en que se puede movilizarse en nuestra comunidad y que pues se complica a muchas personas moverse dentro de la comunidad. Otras barreras también incluyen acceso a la información, simplemente saber o sabiendo pues dónde ir, dónde se puede ir para recrear, para disfrutar la naturaleza. No se sabe en muchas, muchas instancias y qué se puede hacer para superar esa barrera. También hay accesos a, a barreras en cuanto al acceso a recursos, dinero, tiempo. Y simplemente que no todos siempre se sienten bienvenidos e incluidos en todos los espacios verdes. Muchas veces los espacios verdes son uh, blanqueados, construidos, hablados de una manera que es para gente rico, rica o para gente blanca. Y no todas las comunidades de color, comunidades más pobres, se sienten bienvenidos e incluidos en esos espacios. Entonces es importante conversar sobre las maneras que tenemos y las herramientas que podríamos utilizar para superar todas esas barreras. Y como Comité de Energía y Acción Climática, es súper importante para nosotros no solamente pensar en cuestiones de energía, y el, el cambio climático, sino conectar esos temas al tema de tierra y asegurar que estamos todos pensando de una manera junta sobre nuestra conexión a la tierra, la manera en que estamos cuidando la tierra y el espacio. Y entonces queríamos abrir un poco la conversación para pensar en estos temas de una manera conjunta. Uh, creo que eso es, es todo y lo voy a dejar allí. I think that's it. I'll leave it there. Thanks. Thanks, Satan. So, Let's ask the question, what should we do to make better, new, more accessible uh, recreation space, green space within the town? Something that I think we just bump up against in every single group is around transportation and our ability to influence transportation. I think that is a huge factor in accessing recreational space um, in our town, the lack of public transportation. I was going to try to keep quiet and hear what other people... Hold, hold on a sec, Steve. Hold oh. Just a sec. Okay, go ahead. Go ahead. I was going to try to keep quiet and hear more what community members had to say, but I see Ashwin's question as, as two issues. One is, do we desire more public land, publicly, publicly accessible and or preserved land? And, 
that's one question. And the separate question is the accessibility of that land. And I totally agree with what um, Gassi Kaya just said, the transportation is a problem. Yet I think, I'm not sure, but I think there's a lot of land available uh, that's close by that maybe people aren't aware of. So perhaps one strategy would be to help people become more aware of those parcels that are located within the town and within walking distance of the population um, centers. Before you jump in, Bernard, I just wanted to give us all a pause so that Rosanna can process and think if she has anything to share herself other than just translating what we're all saying. Did you want to share anything, Rosana? ¿Quieres decir algo, Rosana? Uh, I think Ashwin, uh, we're talking about uh, many things and, and uh, uh, also about the barriers um, that is uh, very important to overcome uh so people could have access to those to all of these uh, resources that uh, we have uh, around the land um so how to do that um i think uh, uh, the plan of course <laughs> the plan the plan has to be uh, in place and also the community has to participate, uh, all the communities um, around the town, uh, because uh, every, every, every person, every family, every communities uh, have their own needs and, and, and it will be great that we could write that <laughs> and, and, and be aware that, oh, okay, this, so we have a lot of needs um, in, in place. So we have, now we have to work how to give uh, the environments that, that these different communities need to, uh, I don't know, to flourish <laughs> uh, together, yes. <laughs> Bernard? It just occurred to me that we might usefully parse Steve's distinction of questions further. 
the issue of um, transportation access, the question, do we want more public lands? I want to point out that publicly accessible lands need not be publicly owned lands, particularly for larger tract owners. And to make that happen, I think you need liability protection and perhaps funding, grant funding for installing trails, signage, a play structure for those interested in building those community connections. Great, uh, great comments, Bernard, um, and especially from a from a landowner's perspective, uh, you know, working lands. Uh, or, um, are there anyone else have comments and thoughts about access, land type, land use, uh, in terms of getting people closer to the natural system, the nature in in the town, as well as uh, bringing them together or strengthening the town as well, which has kind of been the themes we've seen. Are you good, Rosanna? Can I go? Okay. <laughs> um, so Healthy Hampshire and um, namely my colleague Sarah has done some work around um, studying disability access of public um, uh, open spaces and green spaces in Northampton. Um, so, you know, that's Northampton. But um, one of the things she found in that project that I thought was really interesting um, was a lot of concern from folks who have low mobility or just sort of having like beautiful neighborhoods. Um, so, you know, having a lot of trees and, and like being able to look out their window and see beautiful um, natural landscapes and things like that. So I do think um, from an access perspective, a lot of the time it is very, it's a matter of really like micro environment. Um, Oop, hold on. Yep. Okay. Can I? Oh yeah. Speak. <laughs> okay. Um, um. There are well, there are something very important around us that is the pandemic, so we can avoid that. So that um, change is changing our life. <laughs> Um, and uh, also at this time in, in Amherst, um, 
there are people, the, uh, the essential workers that we have in the town, they are suffering for this pandemic. They are uh, sick uh, and they are in quarantine in their homes. They are, um, they are not working at this time. So also, also, um, I don't know if how we could introduce these topics in the plan uh, or um, how to, um, through this plan also could uh, help these people or um, to give some release, some things that they need to be, uh, I don't know, but this is things that we have to, to think uh, because now we have to incorporate this pandemic in all our plans. Uh, and, and unfortunately, <laughs> but uh, how we could uh, live with this or I don't know, at least for some time, hopefully. <laughs> Uh, but um, these are changing many things around, yes? So there are restrictions for us to, to breathe. <laughs> uh, um, yeah, there are many things. So it's, it's, it's only to, to think uh, how we could help also through this uh, plan um, um, around this situation. Okay, yeah, I will. Lauren. Sure, thanks everyone. Um, I know we're getting done on time now, so I'll keep it short, but I just wanted to connect a few dots um, related to things that Ashwin brought up, things that Marita had brought up, who I know we lost a little early, and then what Yo uh, Rosanna had just said, um, especially with so many parents at home with kids right now and having to figure out um, childcare in the context of the pandemic, um, having spaces where kids can play and um, it feels more important than ever um, and where they can be connected to nature as well, um, which can help keep us healthy at this time. Um, so I wanted to make the connection between those things and what Ashwin was talking about earlier around um, how welcome people feel in, in spaces and to what Rosano was saying about how um, involving the community in planning processes can help to connect the needs of the community to how that open space ends up being used. Um, so I, I I didn't really have a specific takeaway, but just that these things are so interconnected and I really appreciated Rosanna's um, final comment there around tying into the pandemic and, and thinking about um, how, how our open spaces can um, serve us well in this time as well.
Johanny, you have any uh, comments or thoughts about this? You've been listening a lot. Bueno, sí, o sea, en cuanto a la pandemia, sí que es algo eh, frustrante para la persona, como tú dices, que tan positivo, eh, que están en la casa y más son familia con niños, donde quizá el espacio es limitado, donde quizá son más de cinco o seis personas y solo tienen dos habitaciones y no, o sea, los niños no tienen ningún espacio donde esté lo aislado o, o muy limitado para ellos. Eso es algo, algo frustrante. O sea, eh, es algo que, que, que uno no puede ni imaginar. O sea, yo, yo que tengo, o sea, que tengo dos hijas, eh, para mí si son más grandes, son, eh, para mí sería frustrante. Y más, una persona que tenga niños pequeños sería algo mayor todavía, y donde no tenga ninguna ayuda de, de cómo ellos solucionar ese problema y ese inconveniente. Uh, well, yo, eh, <laughs> Johanny, uh, Johanny, uh, <laughs> Johanny said that, um, well, it's, muy frustra it's very frustrated uh, for families uh, that are in, in at home right now, uh, especially with uh, little children. Um, there, are, they, there are families that have uh, see five, six people at home with two rooms only. Um, so this is uh, uh, this is something that we can imagine, uh, but is 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 very frustrating for for people. And and uh, she has two daughters, and she can imagine that uh, she's happening um, um, uh, for for them uh, that that will be frustrated because they have to be inside the house uh, without the possibility to go outside. So, um, yeah, she wanted to express these things. Y aparte, eh, el nivel económico también eh, afecta muchísimo porque a veces son los lo, lo que llevan la, la sala, la, la que pagan la casa, sea la mamá o sea el papá, o sea los dos que estén, que estén contagiados, entonces no tienen, son personas que se quedan sin presupuesto, sin trabajo no saben cómo pagar su billing, cómo pagar su casa. Y a, a, entonces, encima de eso también tener la preocupación de estar aislado y, y no estar con sus niños, a veces estar con, con sus niños, preocupado por la enfermedad y preocupado también por la economía. Eso es algo sumamente frustrante. Uh, yeah, is is um, uh, also the, the financial aspect is is uh, affect all these families. Um, um, the, the, the people is is are like desperate because uh, they are uh, are at home with so resources. Um, they don't know how to pay the rent uh, because they don't have jobs. Uh, because if they are uh, living together, it's a family, both the, 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 uh, the parents are not able to work. So uh, this is a very difficult situation that people are living right now. And uh, yeah, also um, uh, there are times that they are in different rooms um, in quarantine and the, and the kids are in, in, in the living room because uh, they need to be separated. So this is a lot of anxious, a, a lot of things that involve these situations. Yeah, those, thank, thank you, uh, Johanny and uh, Rosanna. That the, the, the issues around the, what's happening right now and how, uh, how hard it is to make ends meet, but also to just live uh, is, is palpable.
So I know that we have to finish up and I just wanted to um, really appreciate uh, Rosanna for all the translation work um, and for everyone for sharing so honestly. I think, you know, while the committee has these really important goals around climate change, I hope that it will be, that the committee will be able to really hold also that that so many families are in desperation about tomorrow um, and that even though yes climate change is coming very quickly tomorrow is coming much quicker Thank you. Uh, I think we, it's time for us to go ahead and, and wrap up this conversation. I'd like to thank Johanny and Rosanna and Caitlin for uh, putting together a lovely description, really valuable description of uh, the mobile market, the process and the reality. I'd like to thank uh, Stephen Ashwin for putting together some of the big moves for the thoughts today. Uh, and um, we will schedule another meeting. The next, the last meeting uh, in about a month. Uh, we'll let everybody know as soon as we get it all figured out uh, where we will talk more about how we're going to do the things that we're talking about doing uh, and what the pathways are to do those. Any final thoughts? I do, I have one. I, I just wanna say how much I appreciate um, you, Jim and Gazikaya and um, Stephanie and Ashwin. I just think you're doing, um, and Lauren, I know you're taking notes. I think you're doing a really awesome job um, facilitating this group and I appreciate how much thought um, and planning and care is going into these meetings. Great, thank you everybody. I think we'll say good afternoon and we'll talk to you in a month. Bye. 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 Bye.